You're tuned in to the New Life Fellowship audio service. Here at New Life, we believe in facilitating a worship service that reflects the abundant new life that Jesus wants to give us in John 10.10. As you listen to today's sermon, feel free to share points that stand out to you on social media and use the hashtag NewLifeAU to join the national conversation. Enjoy today's message. That you allow the Spirit to convince you of His closeness and His intentionality. And never letting go of any human being, no matter how far they've gone. He's always trying to hang on to us. And so with that in mind, Father, we just turn our eyes to you. Recommitting ourselves. Uh, to discovering your ideal for us. Believing that you mean good for us. Believing that your word is good. And even believing that you yourself, the essence that is God, is good. And we believe that your mercy endures forever. So please smile on us as we've gathered to lift up your name in a hope that that would inspire your response to us. May our eyes be open. May our ears be open. Show us your glory. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, amen, amen. You know, I thank God for getting us this far on this bad sex journey. Um, It's been quite the journey. And uh, not only have I been a preacher, but I've also been a recipient throughout. And it's just been an amazing experience to to go to God for myself and just rededicate myself afresh to his ideal for me. I do want to draw our attention back to uh, a segment in bad sex part two, uh, where we introduced everyone here to this clean time counter app, the clean time counter app. And we gave a challenge for the next 105 days, which is 15 weeks for individuals to hone in on that area of sexual weakness, to get an accountability partner, and for the next 105 days, commit themselves to chasing after God's ideal. It has been an amazing journey for me to partner with certain students who have come by the office, shot me an email or even a text message and let me know, hey, chap, I'm on day four. Chap, I'm on I'm on day seven. And it's just been amazing to see people saying I got this crew around me. I want anyone to know that started out on this challenge. If you have fallen away from it, I want you to pick it up today and start it again. I wanted to make sure we revisited this challenge because some individuals will walk away from it and feel as if because they took a fall or something of that nature that I guess the message and the restoration wasn't for me. No, it's for you. Sometimes it just takes a little bit more pushing, a little bit more striving, a little bit more surrender. So I want to invite anyone here who is seeking restoration in their sexual ethic To take this 105-day challenge simply means you get an accountability partner, you pull them close, you let them know your story, and you say, and I need you to get beside me and kind of hold me up in my weak moments. Once again, that's the Clean Time Counter app. Clean Time Counter app. You can find different versions. But I want to invite you to take that journey. And for all of us who are on the journey... I want to remind you that you can't do it by yourself. You need some support. So please do not hesitate to tell someone who you can trust your story and let them know that you'd love that support. We're going to uh, look at a character in the Bible who desperately needed an accountability partner, but but often found himself alone. As a matter of fact, there's, there's rarely a time when he's not alone except for a time when he's having bad sex. So I want to turn your attention to Judges, the 16th chapter, where we're going to look at this character 
and try to see if we can mine some good treasures, some new treasures from familiar territory. Judges chapter 16, I'm going to take it on from the New English translation, beginning with verse 1, hopping down to verse 2, 3, and finishing with verse 4. That's Judges 16, verses 1 through 4. I want everyone to read this with me, because I think there's some new good stuff we can glean from this very common story. If you can see it, say, "Uh uh-oh, excellent. Samson went to Gaza. Now, where did he go? Okay, that's very, very important for you to remember throughout our discussion. Samson went to Gaza. There he saw a what? A prostitute. Now, remember at the end of part three, don't you remember Leah purchased sex? You remember that in last week's part? Well, that's not just a female problem. It looks like it's a male problem, too. He saw a prostitute and went in to have what? Man, I thought after four weeks of talking about this, we'd be just a little bit more comfortable in saying it out loud, okay? Uh, What did he have? Thank you. Did it feel good to just get that out? Yes, sex with her. Verse 2, the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, so they surrounded the town and hid all night at the city gate, waiting for him to leave. They relaxed all night, thinking he will not leave until morning comes, then we will kill him. Verse 3, man, this is one of the most powerful stories in the Bible because it's just so impossible and incredible. It says Samson spent half the night. Other versions say Samson awoke at midnight. That's important with the prostitute. Then he got up in the middle of the night and left. He grabbed the doors of the city gate as well as the two posts and pulled them right off. Bar and all. There's a reason why the writer says bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and carried them up to a hill overlooking Hebron. We'll talk to a little bit more about what that actually would take. Verse 4, our final text. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the Sorek Valley, better known as the Valley of Grapes. Jesus, may everything, Father, may everything, Holy Spirit, may everything you show me happen here today. Amen. Um, With the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to speak to you underneath the title, Bad Sex, Part 4. Bad Sex, Part 4. I've been looking at some blogs that actually speak against abstinence. And I've been trying to get the other side of the story. I mean, we've been talking about remaining true, remaining pure, uh, keeping with God's word. But I actually wanted to see how individuals attempt to justify going opposite of God's word and the benefits that they said would come of this. And there seemed to be this overwhelming consensus from every writer that the best reason that you should engage in sex before marriage is simply this. It is because you need to test drive your purchase. I'm talking about every blogger that I read who was trying to advocate for this. That what they were really saying is you need to know whether or not you're compatible. You need to know whether your physical chemistry is right. You need to figure out if they can do the right things the right way. The reason that you need to engage in sexuality before marriage is because you need to first test drive before you purchase. So I want you to see... Uh, this formula on the screen because I believe that this logic boils down to this equation very simple ability plus power equals chemistry what they're trying to sell us is this truth that first you have to see if the other person this this interest you have has the ability to satisfy you and if you feel some power in that thing if you feel that, 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 that great climax, that massive crescendo to where you're like, oh, my goodness, I don't, I, don't, 
I didn't even know I could be taken to these types of places. When I start feeling that, I see that their ability matches up with power, and now I know I got good chemistry. Oh, but has anybody else had a wonderful moment with a person and then found out that's not the person for you? Uh, Isn't that more common than uncommon? For the butterflies to get going, for the fireworks to start sparking, for you to even have this amazing moment with an individual, only some time later to find out, no, this ain't the person for me. And so I want to suggest this second equation that you see on the screen now. Ability plus power really only means you got talent. That's all that means. It doesn't mean we're right for each other. It just means you're talented. Now, this is major for our generation because we are a part of the entertainment generation here on the planet. And what that simply means is we usually are going to gauge someone's rightness, someone's correctness, someone's uh, uh, compatibility with us based on whether or not they have this ability and give us this sensational feeling of power. That's why some people... Yes, some people can look at pornography on Friday night and preach a sermon the next morning and baptize 60. Now, you will sit in your pews and you will say that person must be connected when in actuality they are just talented. That's why some individuals can get a mic and sing a song and have everybody raising their hands and everybody lifting their head, shouting to God and even exposing themselves in front of masses of people. And that happens not because they got a connection. It's just that they're that talented. And for far too long, we have looked at stages and we have attempted to gauge someone's connection, someone's compatibility, someone's chemistry based on their abilities and the power we feel coming from them. But what if I told you that you could have the most amazing moment with a person and they could still be just the wrong person? So the test drive theory fails because if anything... It will invite you to encounter and experience a person, get fooled into thinking they're right because you base rightness on ability and power. Thinking that you guys are meant to be with each other for the rest of your life when in actuality, the person that you're with is just that talented. See, some of y'all don't believe me yet, so I want you to look at Judges chapter 16. Because I need, you, I need you to see for, for a fact. A lot of times we jump Samson's story straight to Delilah. But the most amazing part for me in Samson's story is found with this unnamed prostitute. Watch this now. Notice that he's with a prostitute. We already established that that's bad sex. Many of us would say, yeah, you're right, you're right. I got to give it to you on that one. That is an example of bad sex. But notice that he performs his most miraculous miracle after bad sex. Did anybody see that? Has anybody noticed that? Is it possible to have bad sex and somehow still maintain some level of success. Now, I want to repeat that again. Is it possible for you to be engaged in bad sex and still maintain some level of success? I think that the Bible is very clear. In Judges 16 and verse 1, Samson went to Gaza. There he saw a prostitute and went in to have sex with her. Verse 2 says, the Gazites were told Samson has come here. So they surrounded the town and hid all night at the city gate, thinking he will not leave until morning comes. Then we we will kill him. Now, what I'm, what I'm needing to dispel is I believe some people are tempted to repent of their sexual activity, of their lack of striving for God's sexual ideal. You are tempted to repent because you think if you don't repent, you won't be successful. I call it capitalistic repentance. When you believe that somehow repenting is going to make sure you can achieve what you're trying to achieve. 
that repenting is a way that you are going to gain access to these great dreams and aspirations that you have. But I got something that I want to tell everybody in here. And it's a little bit risky because some of you may take advantage of this. Some of you can continue to have bad sex for the rest of your life and yes, achieve the zenith of prosperity and success here on this planet. And a lot of individuals come to church and they are convinced that the only way an individual is successful is if they align themselves with God's ideal. That is not true. There are success story after success story in the Bible of people who never decided to align themselves with God. They were rich. They were famous. They were warriors. They were generals. They were kings. And they were successful while not being aligned with God. Now, many of us run to say, yeah, but they won't live and the earth made new. But see, what I don't want to get us twisted about is, yes, they they will be lost, but that has nothing to do with their time here on the planet. For even God says, what does it profit you to gain the whole world and yet lose your own soul? How is it then that he uses this analogy if it's impossible to gain the whole world and lose your soul? What he's really trying to say is it is possible. You can actually gain everything and lose your soul. I'm looking at Samson and he sleeps with a prostitute and performs one of the greatest miracles we are ever shown in the Bible. Some of you want to say, well, why is this such a great miracle? Let me break this down for you. Man, I read this amazing paper this week. It was written by Dr. William Barrick. He is an Old Testament scholar in the Baptist Theological Seminary in Denver, Colorado. His paper is is entitled, Samson and Gaza's Gates. And what he wanted to do was establish how much these gates weighed and how far Samson took these gates based on the biblical narrative. He wanted to do this by looking at archaeological digs and comparing some source materials that spoke of cities that were built during the Bronze Era, which started at about 3000 B.C., 3600 B.C. And so he writes in his in his paper, he says this, he says, If we look closer at the evidence, we will quickly be convinced that Samson's carrying of these gates may be the most powerful miracle we see in the Bible. He breaks down the fact that these gates, most likely, based on all of his research, weighed between 5,600 and 10,000 pounds. 5,600 to 10,000 pounds, and he states, and that is only if you use the most conservative of calculations. If, in fact, we accept that this was the capital city of the Philistine nation, he then says that we would have to assume that these gates would not be like the other gates of surrounding cities that we have excavated. A matter of fact, he estimates that when you add on the bronze that most likely covered and plated these gates, that These gates could have weighed in excess of 21,000 pounds. I'm like, what in the world? It then even says that the way these gates were constructed, if you look at the original text, it actually says that he plucked the gates out of the ground. This same word for for plucked is synonymous with what we would see in the Bible when it comes to removing a tent stake so that you could fold up your tent and move on. Most of these gates, they were anchored underground. They were anchored many feet underground so that a person could not ram them and break through them because they were anchored some 10, sometimes 15 feet by these pole cords that would go down the hinge and into the ground surface. And I'm looking at that and I'm saying, wait a second. This man did not burst through the gates. He didn't break them. But the Bible says that he pulled the gates off, bar and all. He removed the anchoring system of the gates. 
I know that's not excited to some of you guys, but I'm just looking at Judges 16, verse 3, and I'm like, are you serious? He didn't just remove the, date, the gate off the hinge. He didn't just bust it open and then take shards of it away. He walked up to a gate that was fortified to take on armies, thousands of men, and he decides he's just going to put it on his shoulder and carry it off somewhere. It's one of the most crazy things I've ever heard. But check this. Gaza is 100 feet above sea level. Hebron, if you go to the city of Hebron, is some 36 miles away, and it is 3,300 feet above sea level, which is an incline of over, uh, over 3,000 feet. That's over half a mile going up into the air. And I'm looking at the text, and I'm saying, oh, my goodness. He took it to a hill, and this guy, man, Dr. William Barrick, says that he would have had to have taken it some 10 miles minimum to get to the first hill that overlooks Hebron. But just in case he felt like he wanted to show them something, he could have actually tried to take it even further, some 28 miles away from Gaza and set it up on top of a hill. He then concludes that he would have had to generate over 28 horsepower over hours toting some five tons on his shoulders. And all of that happens after bad sex. Man, are y'all feeling me yet on this? I'm looking at the text and I'm like, man, this man just laid with a prostitute. This is just a no-no for a Nazarite. He is a Nazarite by birth. They are not supposed to have any type of engagement with these type of activities. And the Bible said that this brother generated over 28 horsepower to carry over five tons, some 10 to 28 miles uphill just to prove that he could. Here's what else it means. It means that even if you've been engaged in bad sex, God still wants to use you. Oh, man, there have been individuals throughout this series who have admitted, man, I've been involved in bad sex. And you've been wearing this guilt of whether God can still use you, whether he still wants to use you. Some of you have been battling with that damaged goods mentality that I guess God can't use me the way that he wanted to. I've made all these mistakes, so I guess I'm ineligible for any type of ideal blessing. I'm always only going to get the crumbs and the leftovers, but I want you to see here in the text that although Samson goes away from God, God still tries to stay close to Samson. And although he was surrounded by his enemies, although he put himself in that bad position, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon him and he took five tons uphill at least 10 miles just to show that God is great. And I want you to recognize that as we process through, where do we go from here? It is the last part of this bad sex series. What am I left with? You are left with a decision to make. You either decide that God can still use you in spite of what you've done, or you decide that he can't use you in spite of what you've done. And I love the resilience of Samson. And Auntie Ellen White even says in the book Patriarchs and Prophets in the chapter, Samson, this is what she says. She says, says that the reason he woke up at midnight is because midnight is the time of judgment. He felt the judgment of God upon him, but he repented in the midnight hour, and instead of punishing him, punishing him for his sin, God sent the Spirit to bail him out of his situation. God actually doesn't want to punish you. I'm going to say that again. God does not want to punish you. A matter of fact, what he prefer to do is for you to have the story that you have and to now be just converted, redeemed, and transformed. For you to go out there, grab the gates of your oppression, take them up on a hill so that people can see them and say, what is that about? Oh, that's the time when God still delivered me in spite of my foolishness. 
Matthew Henry goes further to say that in this act, Samson is carrying out a type for Christ. What that means is he's representing what Christ would do later. And he says that just as Samson got in the darkest moment of the night and pulled up the gates from the city, so Jesus would later come to planet Earth and in the darkest of of hours go down to hell itself, pull the gates up, take the whole system them with him, take it to a hill called Calvary and set it right on top. I want you to see that Jesus would love to use you. He would love to take your testimony of where you were. He would love to take your testimony of what you were into. He would love to take your testimony of how many partners you've had. And he would love for you to grab those gates, take them up on a hill, and set up a memorial to how strong God is. This is what God would love to do because he showed that he can still use us after bad sex. Here's the part that is going to trouble most of us. It's verse 4 and the first three words. Samson repented. God heard him. He did this miraculous thing for God, which was a witness to the country. And then it says, sometime later. Ah, yes, yes. This is it. This is the place where we need to be. Because even after you get that burst of spiritual high, when you've recognized and realized that God still wants to use you, even after you've done a couple or a few or even dozens of miraculous things for him or even done small things that have meant big things to other people. I don't care how much time you go. There's always this some time later. That's the time when the urge comes back. That's the time when the memories of the old habits return. That's the time when you start sitting there and saying, man, I actually miss turning up at the club with my crew. That's the time when you look through your contact list on your cell phone and say, I think I can still call them and they'll answer. See, it's some time later. It's not really about the spiritual high moment. God has already proven he wants to use you. I want to know what's going to happen in your story sometime later. What's going to happen two weeks from now? What's going to happen two months from now? Where will you be two years from now? Will your repentance remain? Will you allow God to take residence in your life? Will you be content with having the spirit come upon you, but not allowing the spirit to come inside of you? I want to know where will you be sometime later? Because the Bible says, That even after God proved his love for Samson, in his moment of indiscretion, some time later, he met a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name is Delilah. If we don't get the victory over bad sex, there are two things that you will find yourself into sometime later. The first is you will be in the wrong place. You, you'll just find yourself in the wrong place. The Bible writer is being very particular here what he says in the valley of Sorek, which is translated the valley of grapes. Now, Samson is a Nazarite, and there are three things that Nazarites are supposed to abstain from. Cutting of hair, touching unclean things, and consuming any product of the vine or the grape. So what is a Nazarite doing chilling in the Valley of Grapes? That's like Superman being in the Valley of Kryptonite. It is an element that's counter to you. It's an element that you should never get close to. A matter of fact, it's an element that weakens you. 
I need all of you to think about. Anyone who's saying, man, I want to recommit myself to this sexual ethic. I need you to recognize that there are certain triggers that prophesy your fall. It could be a film. It could be a TV series. It could be a late night habit. It could be a substance. I don't know what it is, but they're called triggers. What happens is whenever you get to that place, if you encounter that trigger, it just starts triggering other effects in you that lead you down the path to going back where you came from. The Bible says that we are very similar to pigs who always return to mud after they've been clean or dogs that always return to vomit after they have spit up. The Bible is trying to say there's some type of proclivity. There's this engine that always wants to return back to the dysfunction of your past. And I want you to know that there are certain things in your environment that you you must sterilize today. No, I need you to do it. I don't care how much money you spent on iTunes. Some of that music is a trigger for you. It is your valley of grapes. I don't care how many videos you have saved on your laptop. I don't care how many DVDs you have in your collection. That is your valley of grapes. I don't care how long you've been friends with that individual. I don't care how long she has held you down. I don't care how many times he's come to your aid. You need to get away from that because that's your valley of grapes. There are certain triggers in our life that prophesy our failure. The writer is trying to tell everybody who understands, listen, Sam, Samson's in trouble because instead of being back home, he's chilling in the valley of grapes. Whatever it is, I'm actually asking you, whatever it is, you need to return home today. You need to burn it. You need to trash it. You need to let that person know we can't vibe together anymore, and I'll tell you about it later when I'm stronger. I don't care what it is, but today you need to assess what are your valley of grapes? What is it that always you will always encounter, and it will lead you to this bad sex? But I said there were two things. The first is you'll end up in the wrong place. The second thing is you'll end up with the wrong person. Here it is. Check this out. This story, I don't even care if somebody argued it was a fake narrative. This thing is just so powerful when it comes to the brilliance of the writer. Her name is Delilah. Delilah means a weak and feeble consumer. It means a weak and feeble consumer. I'm looking at the Hebrew definition for Delilah, and I'm like, are you serious? This plot line can't get any better. The man of God is in a garden of kryptonite with a woman whose name means weak, and his name means son of the sun. He's strong. He is with the direct opposite of what he should be with. Man, can we talk about being unequally yoked and what that really means? I'm so tired of the word games and the semantics people bring up when it comes to being unequally yoked. What it really means is there are individuals out there who are actually your direct opposite. And if you are to link with them, you will not, I want to repeat this, you will not be the person that brings them to you. You will be the person that gets brought to them. It's kind of like in multiplication. If you times a positive number with a negative number, what will always happen to that number? It'll be negative. Some of y'all are like, why'd you choose multiplication? Well, in the garden, Jesus said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and do what? Yeah, that's what he said. The God's expectation is always multiplication. And when I'm looking at putting a negative with a positive, you always get negative. And I'm looking at Samson in a valley of grapes with a young lady who's sitting there looking good and definitely has caught his eye. But I wish he understood that this is the direct opposite of you, brother. And if you get linked with her, you're going to be turned into a negative. Here's why. Divorce is going up so fast. Divorce is climbing 
Because I think so many people have been found in the wrong place with the wrong person that then they get tied together and then they don't like it afterwards. That's it. It's bad sex. No, I don't have any research paper to quote to you, but I do recognize the universal principles of God's nature. And I believe that the reason why divorce is going through the roof is because bad sex is also going through the roof. Samson, the strongest man that's ever lived, a Nazarite, is found in the wrong place with the wrong person. And Judges 16, verse 21, says these words. The Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza and bound him in bronze chains. Where did they bring him back to? I don't care what you do in your repentance journey during this series. If you don't let God get the victory over this bad sex, you will be brought to the same place that God delivered you just some time before. And notice, because of the weight and the intricacies of these gates, most likely they had not been fully reconstructed yet. So when Samson is being walked back through the gates, he can't see what's going on, but I believe he hears some saws going. I believe he hears some hammers going. I believe he hears some workers talking, and he knows exactly where he is. This is the same place where God just delivered me, and I'm back. And not only am I back, I'm back half the man I was when I left. When he left, he had hair. He's back. He don't have that hair. When he left, he was strong. He's back. He's not strong anymore. When he, was le- when he left, he was victorious. He's back. Now he's a captive. I want you to recognize that bad sex will never have anything good for us. And although the world is trying to convince everyone through media and through literature and through any other medium like music, I want you to recognize that I don't care what you see on the screen, bad sex will destroy you. But the Bible says, the Bible says we must flee fornication for every other sin we commit happens outside the body. But fornication is destruction against your own body. For when he left, he could see. But now that he's back, he's blind. This bad sex series is not simply just an invitation. It is a mandate to the people of God. And let us look at our brother here as prime example. If we don't let God lead us to victory, if we don't surrender it, if we don't repent, truly repent with all of our heart, we will end up returning to the same place where he delivered us. As a musician begins to play, you know, I like interpreting Bible stories uh, like, like a film script. And I think the Philistines did not know. I think their barbarism pushed them a little bit too far. They did not know that the punishment that they handed down was a punishment that actually led to their own demise. The Bible says that as they, with lust in their eyes, tortured Samson and took from him his own eyes. The Bible says that he was made blind. This is a problem. As I'm watching the film, I'm saying, oh, that's a bad move. As I'm watching the film, I'm saying, no, no, no. Who told you that that was the correct strategy? No, Philistines, if if you really want to have mastery over this guy, that is not the way to go. Because every time Samson falls, his story always begins with, and he saw a woman in Timnah. And he laid with a prostitute that he saw. 
in Gaza. It was his eyes. His eyes were destroying him. His eyes were taking the promise of God away from him. His eyes were causing him to lust. His eyes were causing him to disobey. It was his eyes that was his weakness. So as the Philistines surround him and tie him up and take that hot iron to gouge out his eyes, I'm saying, wait a second, don't do that. The weakest thing about this man is his eyes. But once he is blind, now he begins to see. Now he sees what God meant for him. Now he sees his purpose. As he grinds that stone every day, the Bible says that his hair begins to grow back. And I believe that in his heart, he had truly repented of his sin. He truly looked to God and said, man, I had bad sex and it destroyed me. It made me half the man I am. But God, if you would just give me one more chance, just give me one more shot. I promise I won't let you down. They took his weakness from him. And they didn't know that in his pain, he was being made strong. Today, I call you to let, to let God take your weakness from you. It was painful, but I believe in God's divine providence and love for Samson that he allowed them to take his eyes. He allowed them to take it. And he cried as Samson cried. And every night he would walk around, I believe, Samson's bedroom and try to give him encouragement. And all he was saying is, I'm still here. You're still my guy. Still got plans for you. And it was that comforting voice that led him to the temple of Dagon where he would now get the chance to prove himself before God. Because God said, all right, Samson, I got a mission for you. I want you to walk out the journey of my son. What my son's going to go through, I want you to go through the same thing for me. I need a symbol to the world. I need a testimony about what my son Jesus would do. You see, Jesus was bound by his enemies. Samson was too. Jesus was tortured by his oppressors. Samson was too. See, Jesus even said, my God, why have you forsaken me? He couldn't feel him or see him, and and Samson couldn't either. Yes, his enemies made sport of him on a grand stage before everyone, And the Bible says that Samson was taken to the colonnade where they made sport of him too. Jesus was placed between two things. Samson was then placed between two pillars. Jesus had to get his greatest victory of salvation, not in life, but in death. And it is Samson that said, let me avenge my two eyes. Give me strength just this one last time. Let me die with the Philistines. And Jesus, too, lifted up his head, said, it is finished. And he, too, died among sinners. You want to know how Samson got his strength back? He accepted the call to be like Jesus. And he used all that strength to push, and he used all that strength to pull all that strength to push and all that strength to pull until the Bible says that he killed more in his death than he ever did in his life. He became like Jesus. He became just like Jesus. And it is your turn today. It's time. Bad sex just isn't about guilt. It's about becoming like Jesus. And the Bible says that John the Baptist cried in the wilderness, said, repent and be baptized. This wasn't a baptism of membership. This was a baptism of citizenship. 
one who says, I repent of my sins and I want to give God everything. And today I want to call you for the same thing. We're going to have a baptism not too long from now. And I want you to be a part of it. Once again, this is not a baptism into membership. This is a baptism of repentance. This is the baptism of John the Baptist who had no church, but he had a message. Repent and be baptized. And throughout this series, you have been pricked in your conscience and been convicted that God wants you to rededicate yourself to him and when it comes to your sexual ethic and seeking after true obedience to his word. He wants to renew and transform your life. He wants to make you like Jesus. And if that is your desire, I want you to come forward today. I want you to make that bold step. Where are you? No, this is the time. This is what we've been preaching about. I believe that God has called individuals here to repent and to come forward and say, I'm going to be a part of that baptism. I'm going to allow that symbol of being dead to my old self and being resurrected to a brand new self. I'm going to let that happen to me. I'm going to come out here on a grand stage in front of all these onlookers. And I'm going to show my repentance to Jesus Christ. Would you just come forward? Please let God win today. Please let him win today. In the name of Jesus, I want to praise you, Father, for you are mighty to save. God, you are strong and mighty. Moses, when he crossed the Red Sea, he cried out to you in song and said, The Lord is a warrior, and warrior is his name. And I believe today, oh God, you weren't just in Rome, robe, but I believe you are ironclad in armor. You came to new life to wage war on our behalf. You said to us, as you said to Joshua, do not worry about the battle, for the battle is the Lord's. God, I want to thank you for fighting on behalf of us. I want to thank you for week after week, for making us alive and awake to your ideal and your will. I pray, oh God, that this would not be momentary, but sometime later that each of us who have responded would find ourselves strengthened in your power and in your might, oh God. We desire to receive from you the full armor of God. Give us the helmet of salvation. Guide our minds from the things that would try to overturn our commitment. Give us the breastplate of your righteousness so that when those fiery arrows of temptations come upon us, that they would not pierce us, oh God. I pray that you would keep our feet shod with the preparation of your peace. I pray that you would give us the belt of truth so that we would not be attracted to the lies. God, I pray that you would give us the shield of faith. Please give us your shield of faith, oh God. May we believe that this is true. May we believe that it will last. And give us a sword of your spirit. Please don't take your spirit from us. Give us more of your spirit. And may the word of God rest in our life. God, eat, change our appetites. In this moment, in the name of Jesus, I decree that over this crowd. Please change our appetites. May we not want what we used to want. May we not do what we used to do. Yes, Paul says that there are two natures and we do the things that we don't want to do. But he ends it, oh God, with a promise. But I praise God for Jesus. For he can save me from this body of death. I pray that you would save us, oh God. Please save us. Please save us we cry out to you for you are our only hope you are our only shot if you don't save us father who will set us free who will set us free I need you to keep your promise to me and I need you to make a way for each person who has come out who went out on a limb for you today. And I need you to tell them the same thing that you told Zacchaeus. 
look at them there on that limb and you say, I'm going to your house today. I'm going to fill your body today. You are my temple. I purchased you with a great price. And if you would open your door, I am going to come in and have dinner with you. For they heard you standing and knocking. They have opened up the door. So keep your promise to us. For you are not a man that you would lie. But whatever you say, we believe it will happen. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Thank you for listening to the New Life Fellowship audio service. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you and that you will continue to tune in. New Life is located in the Seminary Chapel on the campus of Andrews University, and our services are held every Saturday at 11.45 a.m. Keep up with the latest information about what's happening at New Life by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes and through our social media connections on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Simply type in New Life AU in the search bar and you'll find us. Until next time, may the Lord bless you with a new love, new integrity, new faith, and a new experience.